being recorded for later, although again, you, you can't use the recording to get pesticide license credits just because that question sometimes comes up. I think at this point, I am going to hand it over to Josh uh, for the first part of the webinar. I, I just, just um, I am really excited that we have two guest speakers here today, one from UMass and one from the state of New Jersey, who's gonna show us a live spotted lanternfly infestation. Um, and again, if you have any questions about getting credits or technical issues or anything, either send me a message in the chat or just email me. I'll put my email in the chat so that you can just concentrate on the webinar, okay? All right, Josh, I'm handing it over to you. All right, thank you very much, Jen. Um, it's great for everyone to be here. We do have a nicely large size audience and I'm gonna try and get through the educational stuff uh, at a decent rate so uh, you guys can get to the live video portion of it because that is, I think, going to be the most exciting. Um, so welcome to our webinar. Um, just some ground rules very quickly, which Jen has already covered in brief. If you're attending for uh, state license credits, either from the Mass Department of Agriculture or uh, the Forestry Division, make sure that your uh, email, pesticide license number, and mailing address have already been submitted to, uh, to us. If they haven't, you can send it to Jennifer Foreman uh, or at mass.gov. The address is right there on the screen. If you're looking for um, forester credits or um, external credits from MCA, MCH, M or MCLP, um, you will do those individually on your own. Uh, we'll only handle the paperwork for the uh, pesticide credits. Uh, and if you're doing that, make sure you stay for the whole thing and answer all the questions. And any questions you have, put them into the Q&A box. Uh, and of course, at the end, you'll get information on the next webinar in our series, because this is uh, the second webinar in a four-part series on spotted liner flies. So you can get seasonal information on this pest. Uh, so very briefly, we're going to go over the basics for those of you who maybe need a refresher or who are less familiar with this insect. This is the spotted lanternfly right here. Its Latin name is Lycorma delicatula. It is in the order Hemeptera, which makes it a true bug. So despite its appearance with the very broad wings, it is not a butterfly or moth. It is more closely related to things like stink bugs, um, aphids, assassin bugs, cicadas. These are all true bugs as well. Uh, this insect has over a hundred different host plants, including tree of heaven, black walnut, maple, grapes, apples, hops, a um, huge variety of host trees, but tree of heaven is their preferred host. And like many of the invasive species we are currently dealing with in the United States, uh, it is from Asia, which is a side effect of our like interconnected global economy and uh, shipping things all over the place. So this is the spotted lanternfly right here. Um, it's not always gonna have the nice spread wings like it is in the photo. This is a, a dead insect that's been pinned, which is why it's so nicely displayed. If you're finding it in the wild alive, it's gonna look more like it does on the right, which is what you'll see in the video when we get to that part. So it's about a half to one inch long, so it's a good size insect. And uh, when the red uh, hind wing, that very bright red hind wing from which it gets its name, uh, is not displayed. It's going to be at rest with the wings folded and they'll be somewhat visible underneath the, uh, the modeled gray forewing, like you can see there. Um, and when the adults get uh, more mature, they do have a black and yellow banded abdomen, especially the females when they're gravid and carrying eggs, as you can see in the picture on the left. And uh, to sort of help it, you know, you, you differentiate it from a butterfly or moth, you'll notice it does not have these prominent antennae. Uh, the antenna it does have are those little orange dots underneath its eyes right there. Um, so that's what you want to look for. Again, it's a pretty distinct looking insect. There are some lookalikes. Uh, we'll show you that in a moment. But uh, this right here shows you the proboscis. And this is what it does damage to plants with. It's got that very long piercing mouth part. It puts it directly into the plants. It sucks the sap out of them. And this is what uh, causes damage to the trees. Um, there are some lookalike insects. This is a guide from Virginia Cooperative Extension that shows you some fairly common ones. Um, I think it's a pretty distinct looking insect, but we've gotten some people who have reported in things like buck moth and uh, leopard moth, this webworm, um, other insects like that. So with lanternfly, again, you want to make sure it's got the um, either the, the gray mottled forewing and the bright red hindwing. Uh, its body shape is going to be a little different from a moth. It doesn't have like a fuzzy body. It has pretty long spindly legs. You can see in the top left corner, some moths and butterflies have shorter legs. Um, and the, when, you, when you see the videos of it, I think you'll find it to be 
distinct looking. So just keep these characteristics in mind. So unlike a butterfly or moth, this insect goes to what's called incomplete metamorphosis, which means uh, after the eggs hatch, uh, the, uh, it, it goes through several different nymphs. It does not have a pupil stage or a cocoon. Uh, it goes through four different stages or instars of nymph. The fourth instar is uh, red with these black and white spots. The younger stages are just black and white. Uh, the adults emerge around this time of year. Uh, we are here in smack dab in the middle of August. The fourth and star nymphs are active now. Adults are active in some uh, warmer parts of the country, as you will see. Um, and then they begin laying eggs um, around this time of year, more like in September. Uh, the eggs will overwinter and the adults die off with the first hard frost. So and then those eggs will hatch again in the spring. So that's the lane of fly life cycle. Um, it's one generation per year. And you can see right here, this photo shows the adults in comparison to the nymphs, you can kind of see how small those nymphs are when they first hatch, very, very tiny, getting larger and larger, more distinct looking until they get to that fourth instar with the red coloration, and then the adults where they finally have their wings. Uh, the nymphs, of course, can do damage as well. They have proboscises that will just go after either different plants or different parts of plants that are more tender and succulent and easy for them to drink the sap out of. So. That's the damage that they do. Like I said, they are sap suckers. They suck the sap directly out of plants. Um, and this has several different side effects. Um, one, a plant that has been fed on is going to have reduced sugar production in the fruit. It's gonna have lower levels of photosynthesis and much less uh, cold tolerance or hardiness. So while the lanternfly is not going to directly kill the plant, like say in a merlash borer would, after a couple of years, it completely cuts off the tree's ability to you know, feed itself and deliver water. Um, Spotted lanternfly repeated feeding on a plant is going to severely weaken the trees or the plant. So it might um, you know, die from some other infection. It might die from a uh, cold or something else that's going to come along and deal with it. Um, but it's not just the plant health that um, we should be concerned about. So in the picture on the left, you can see the honeydew, which is that sticky white uh, substance that's building up on the base of the tree. That is the waste product. Um, so you've not just got sap running down the tree, the insects feeding from. You have its waste product, the sticky sweet honeydew. It's full of all these undigested sugars from the sap. And that's going to do a few things. One, it's going to uh, attract the attention of these nuisance insects like wasps, hornets, bees, and ants that are going to feed from the sugar. They're going to feed directly on that waste product. And uh, more significantly, it's going to promote the growth of a black sooty mold, which you can see right here. This photo has a couple things. It's got the swarming lantern fly. It's got the white honeydew building up and it's got the black sooty mold growing all over the ground. And the sooty mold is going to get on the ground, it's going to get on plants, um, grasses, leaves, anything on the ground. And that's um, the growth of that sooty mold is going to cut off the plant's ability to, you know, it's going to cut off its photosynthesis. It can't get sunlight directly onto the, the cells. So it's going to slowly suffocate and kill that plant as well as being pretty unsightly. As you can see right here, <laughs> these plants should not look like this, um, but they're withered and dead. And that is from all the sooty mold that is peppering the entire plant. So with a very bad infestation of lanternfly under a tree, you're going to get the honeydew literally raining down. Um, people in badly infested areas have described the, the, the honeydew waste pouring down as being like rain dripping all over whatever it's under, the ground, the sidewalk, plants, the lawn, cars, furniture, and you get sooty mold growing all over um, plants or anything else. So not only is the lanternfly a pest of trees, it's um, you know very aesthetically displeasing, it's pretty disgusting, and as you're, we're going to see, it's also economically harmful. This is someone's back porch in Pennsylvania that's covered in sticky honeydew, that's not just water. And the lanternfly tends to swarm in large numbers when there's a big population. You can see how they, they're, they're kind of attracted to each other, um, especially during mating season, they're gonna be drawn to each other. Um, here they are just swarming over the silver maple and you can see the sooty mold all over the ground in that big black ring. Um, this just kind of give you ready for like what the video is gonna look like so you can see what they look like um, in the wild. Um, so lanternfly in the United States was first found here in 2014 in Brooks County, Pennsylvania though based on the size of the infestation when first found, it had likely been here for uh, about two years before it was discovered. With a lot of invasive species, um, you know, we first discovered the first infestation once the population has kind of hit a critical mass that's large enough to be discovered by accident. So, you know, they had time to kind of become established. The, uh, the lanternfly likely got here, um, it was like egg masses on a shipment of crushed stone that was brought to the US. Um, and since 
that uh, first discovery in 2014, it is spread to 34 Pennsylvania counties and 11 other states. So it can spread very rapidly. And that is in large part, we'll see due to uh, human activity rather than um, the insect's power to kind of move on its own. Um, it, it can certainly move in on its own, but it's very, very easy to accidentally be moved around to new places. To, it's a good hitchhiker. So this insect is great at spreading. A lot of states have implemented quarantines. Um, the red lines on this map show where there are internal state quarantines. Um, but again, keep in mind, so this was first found in south, uh, southeast Pennsylvania near Philadelphia. Uh, and since then, it has spread to like about half of Pennsylvania, most of New Jersey, despite these quarantines that have been set up, it's spread outside New Jersey. It's gotten to uh, a couple parts of New York. The blue is where there are infestations. The purple dots are where there are um, individual finds, either dead or alive, lantern fly, but there's no established infestation yet. You can see those are dotted throughout New York, Connecticut, um, several places in Massachusetts, which I will show you in a little bit, kind of the more specific places where they are. Um, further south down into Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, North Carolina, uh, was found in Ohio in October 2020. And just last month, an infestation popped up in Southern Indiana. Um, so you can see how quickly this insect can spread uh, and how we have a couple infestations that are pretty close to Massachusetts down in uh, Fairfax County, Connecticut, and in New York as well. So definitely an insect of concern for Massachusetts because this thing spreads fast. So how can it spread? That's a great question. Like I said, it is a great hitchhiker. Um, so it has the ability to kind of move around in all its life stages, the adults, the nymphs, and the egg masses. The eggs can be laid on basically any flat surface. Um, that includes things like firewood, packing crates, um, the sides of or undersides of vehicles, trains. Um, you can think of any good or product that would be shipped from one place to another. You know, think of like a greenhouse in Pennsylvania that's growing um, plants, or maybe it's a Christmas tree farm, uh, a crate of fruit, um, or some sort of just product that's being shipped, not necessarily from a garden center. All it takes is like some lanternfly egg masses that are laid on the side of that crate on one of those nursery products on one of those Christmas trees on the underside of some like lawn equipment, or camping uh, equipment, lawn furniture, anything like that. And it gets shipped across state lines and if the egg masses aren't found until next spring or until they've already hatched, you've got a new infestation. Same thing can happen with the nymphs or the adults. They'll just cling on to um, a vehicle and to a product that gets shipped and be brought around. They, the adults of course can fly out their wings, um, but they are not, you know, the most powerful flyers. They tend to sort of climb up very tall um, objects, usually trees, but in urban areas that could be like uh, telephone poles or lamp posts or houses and buildings. And then they'll fly or glide down to, uh, to a tree or something else where they're going to feed from. So hitchhiking is a great way for them to move around. And tree of heaven, which is again their main hose, can also form these pathways along um, like roadways or highways for them to move around. Tree of heaven loves to grow in disturbed areas like alongside highways. Um, so if you have a bunch of tree of heaven growing alongside a highway or a railroad from one state to the next, that can form a natural pathway of host plants for the spotted lanternfly to move down. So a lot of different ways this insect can spread, especially if it's, it's so tied to, um, to human commerce. It's something we have to be very much aware of. And that brings us to our first poll question, which I believe is going to appear on your screen now. Sure it is. <laughs> <Talk to me. laughs> pending some, uh, some technical difficulties. If you do have questions, again, you can put them in the Q&A and we will answer them at the end of our presentation. I am not gonna lie. There is a non-zero chance that all three questions are gonna show up and I'm not sure why. Um, yep, it's launching all three questions. Hold on. I don't know what I did wrong. One second. <sighs> Give me one second here. All right. And there's my dog. Okay, 
um, I am unable to determine what it is that is keeping us from just having one at a time. So we are going to have to hold all the poll questions until the third question comes up. I am very sorry. I think you should just keep going. Yep, we'll just have all the poll questions at the end since uh, some of them will cover material we haven't gone over yet. That's okay. Um, so just pay attention, everyone, because um, you know you want to remember the things that we just covered. Well, okay. I, I, just a one quick thing, of course. You still you don't have to answer the questions correctly to receive your credits. <laughs> we just need you to answer them. Show that you're paying attention. All right. Um, so. Now we've gone over the basics. Um, the question is, what should you, uh, the concerned public and uh, experts in the tree field, be looking for right now um, from about August through uh, November when we're having our next webinar? So right now, the um, the active life stages are the fourth inch star nymph and the adults. As you can see on our in the photos that look like on the chart right there. The adults are already active and present in the warmer, more Southern states like Delaware, Virginia, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. Um, further north, um, like in New York and Massachusetts, if we have any here, um, we might still be seeing the fourth inch star nymphs and the adults will emerge a little later. Um, of course, like all insects, they need a certain number of warm grown degree days over a certain temperature in order to develop. So that's gonna happen in warmer Southern states before it happens up north. And uh, this is a nice still photo of the lantern fly. You can see the adults and then the one fourth inch star nymph. So you can get a size comparison there in a vineyard somewhere, uh, probably from Pennsylvania. So this is the kind of thing that you'd expect this time of year. Uh, and again, once we see that video, uh, you're gonna kind of get a great sense of what those look like in the wild. Um, swarming adults is what we wanna look for, you know. Um, in a state that doesn't have, like in Massachusetts, where we do not have an established infestation yet, and we've only been finding individual adults. We might not see this yet, um, but still good to know to look for and uh, you know where you wanna look at. Of course, you wanna make sure that you are looking on uh, for hitchhikers. So that means if you are coming from out of state, especially if you are in a state that you know has an infestation such as, again, New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, uh, Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, North Carolina, and now Ohio and Indiana. Uh, Rhode Island as well was on that map, although I don't think they have an infestation, just uh, a dead find. If you were coming from any of those states, you know, because you were camping, you were on vacation, you were traveling, going, uh, traveling for work, whatever, um, you definitely want to make sure you know you're going through an infested area. Make sure you check your vehicle and anything you load into your car for signs of land or fly. Because again, they can just latch onto a vehicle like you can see here and get a ride to Massachusetts where they can hop off and, you know, you can hop up, they can hop off at a rest stop if you like drop your car to get gas, find a tree of heaven, which will probably be growing near these disturbed highway areas and, um, you know, start an infestation. Uh, this also goes, you know, check your clothes as well if you're in one of those infested states, because if a lantern fly hops on your shoulder, you can get inside your car and then it's inside your car, it's still getting a ride. Um, probably a good thing that Joe Biden checked his shoulders before he got into a vehicle after this event because he could have been moving lantern fly. Um, so as I said at the top, there are over 100 different host plants of spotted lanternfly, um, but there's, it's kind of a lot to ask someone to memorize all 100 host plants. So these are kind of the most important ones to remember right now that the fourth and star nymphs and the adults are going after. Of course, tree of heaven, it's the most popular uh, vital host plant in all its life stages, but adults and fourth and star nymphs and adults certainly show a huge preference for them. They have kind of a much broader range of plants they'll go after as nymphs. Uh, especially when they're young, in part because uh, they're smaller proboscises means they can only go after kind of the more tender succulent plants like, uh, you know, rose or the leaves of plants. Um, but the adults can go through the trunk, the bark of the tree of heaven. So tree of heaven is what to look for first. But they're also pretty distinct, so easy to track. Grapevine, that is grapes are the second or the other most common host plant, which is why vineyards are, and grape growers, wine producers are so concerned about spotted lanternfly. A lot of vineyards in Pennsylvania have lost huge amounts of plants because of this insect. Um, so there, there, there are wild grapes as well. So it's not just, you know, vineyards that have to be concerned. If you go into a woodlot or side of a road, um, parks, you will, you know, you look, you can definitely find wild grape vines. Other plants of concern would be the black walnut tree, which you can find in parks. Other nut trees and walnut trees like butternut, all species of maple like red maple and sugar maple, especially those are pretty common here, um, also favored by adults. Um, somewhat less and more favored by the nymphs, black locust and cherry trees. 
Uh, and again, the nymphs have a broad range of hosts, but the adults are primarily going to be found on like the tree of heaven, the grape, and maple. And if you're unfamiliar with what those look like, you know, you can definitely study up. The maples have that distinct kind of trident look to them. The red maples have a red stem. Grape vines have these distinct looking leaves. The leaves grow opposite the tendrils on the vine and the, uh, the woody trunk has kind of the shredded papery looking bark around the wood. And then Tree of Heaven has a kind of cantaloupe textured bark, these big fan shaped leaves and uh, kind of the, the fruits are these Samaras like uh, on a maple or an ash, canoe shaped sort of papery, those leaves or those Samaras will hang on to the plant even after uh, lose its leaves in the autumn. So good to know how to, what to look for them. Um, several different municipalities in Massachusetts have found a lanternfly, and again, there is no established infestation. There are only individual finds of lanternfly throughout the state. They are highlighted here. The first one was in Boston in 2018. The other ones, except for Fitchburg, were found in 2020. Again, these are all adults. They were dead or alive that were shipped into the state by accident from out of state, from somewhere. But those places were in, uh, were in Billerica. Chelmsford, Chilmark, Concord, Dartmouth, Hadley, Lemonster, Ludlow, Milford, Northborough, Norwood, Sharon, Rentham, and Woburn. So a good spread throughout the state. And then just last month, we found a fourth and star nymph in Fitchburg. Um, so through testing, through survey, we have determined that um, there's as of now, we can tell there's say there's no uh, infestation, and the it had likely been brought in by accident a hitchhiker from another state from someone that had just come from out of state. Uh, traps are being put up by the location of the find to see if there are other insects, um, other lanternfly that show up, especially if again there's a population. Um, but we have not found anything so far. So again, this kind of emphasizes the way that lanternfly can spread through human uh, actions, hitchhiking accidentally. So if you're coming from out of state. Definitely make sure you check your vehicle and everything in and around your car for signs of lanternfly because this is how an infestation could start. Uh, very quick update on the survey. Uh, Jen, are we going to be doing the videos after we're done with the slides? Sorry, I'm multitasking. I managed to fix the poll question thing. Um, okay. When this is. I, do you mean, are Jeremy and Saul going to speak after you're done with your entire presentation? Uh, yes, because this is a good stopping point, but I didn't know if they were going to go uh, when we were done with this the slide section. It was up to you, not, not me. So it depends on what you want to do. We can also um, do the first poll question now too, to kind of catch up. I think that's a good idea. And then if uh, either Jeremy or, or Saul are ready, this is a kind of a good break point um, before we finish it because um, we're about to start a new section. So um, we can definitely do that. Well, if it works, we'll see if it works. It might not work. <sighs> no, it's not working. Okay. Um, I give up on Zoom for today. All right, too many mistakes in a row <laughs> have led to this glitch. Um, we're just going to go back to what we're going to do with the poll at the end, hopefully. Um, what was I going to say? Um, all right, so at this point, then, Josh, you want me to switch over to, to the speakers, is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay, thanks. All right, so our first guest speaker for today and I really regret not asking you this first, Saul. Is Saul, is your last name Vicunas? Am I saying it right? It's Vicunas. Vicunas. I am very sorry, Saul. Um, okay. I've actually known Saul for a very long time back when we were both state survey coordinators for New Jersey and Massachusetts, respectively. Um, Saul, you're still listed as just the plant pest survey person for New Jersey, but I find it hard to believe that that's your title, given that you're telling me that you now manage at least 23 staff and you cover not only the Cooperative Agricultural Pest Survey Program in New Jersey, but also um, the spotted lanternfly management in New Jersey. So uh, if you wanna tell us a little bit more about yourself once I switch it over to you, then, then please do. Um, sure. Also, Josh, you should stop sharing your screen so that Saul can share his. Yes, let me 
do that. Okay. Um, so Saul is, is live on the scene with an actual spotted lanternfly infestation. And um, luckily in Massachusetts, we don't have something like this we can show you at this point. But Saul has a lot of practical knowledge and understanding about how to deal with this pest and can show you things on the ground. So I think I'm just gonna switch it over to him to go live if you're ready, Saul, or I can keep- Yeah, talking. I'm actually uh, I'm actually approaching the spot. Um, let me try sharing the screen. Okay, probably looking at me right now. Let's see. That is correct. Now we gotta switch the camera somehow. Uh, hold on. That's odd. The uh, camera switcher is grayed out. Hmm. I need to flip it over. So <laughs> tell me if you can see. Well, this is, I got to flip the camera, but. We're seeing a lanternfly running up a tree. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me stop sharing my screen. Oh, I got to figure out how to flip the camera back to. Uh, uh, let's see. Try that. No, that didn't do it. All right. I've stopped sharing. I'm switching the camera. Now I'm sharing again. Now that's what I want. Okay. So tell go. me if you can see this. This being a tree trunk. Yes. <laughs> yes. You got three lanterns lantern flying on it? Yep. Okay. Good. Good go. All right. So um, that's, uh, there's some lantern fly here. This is a tree of heaven. Uh, in this park um, in 2018, yes, that is stilt grass all over. <laughs> Somebody noticed already. Um, I told you. <laughs> yeah, you did. So here's a grapevine next to the Alanthus tree and you can see uh, the black sooty mold all over it. It should not be black. Um, you can see on the ground, the weeds are looking awfully black and dark, and that's from the sooty mold. Um, you see this little red mark, that tree, um, you saw the mile a minute too, huh? Uh, yeah, we have lots of mile a minute in this park. Here's a lanternfly that jumped onto my hand. See, they're friendly. Um, so uh, this tree was actually an insecticide tree from our program. So this tree was treated with insecticide probably in 2019 and um, but obviously has not been treated this year. So the uh, systemic insecticide only lasts for one season. Let me see if I could get a better grouping of, here's a better one. All right. Uh, so again, so here's sooty mold. You see the color of the leaf here. And if I flip it over, it's much greener on the back. That's the color it should be. And I can feel a slight rain of honeydew landing on me um, because they're constantly uh, feeding. So this is a better grouping here. Uh, now, three years ago at this location, you could barely find one lantern fly. I found three, I think, in this whole park, three adults. So now you've got, um, how's that picture coming through, Jen? You look pretty good. Yeah, I'm really psyched. It looks really cool to me. Yeah, very good right, quality. Gonna... What's that? No, we're, oh, we're just The quality is great, yeah. Yeah, oh, good, good, good. Uh, all right, so I'll, I'll give these guys a little wipe so you can see them move. They're, they're good jumpers. Oh, look, they're not even moving. Hey, there they go. Um, excellent jumpers. There's one on my hand. Um, oh, and here's a fourth instar amongst them. So you guys see that right in the middle? We so can that's, see it, yeah. uh, Okay, and then here's uh, the white stuff you guys were talking about. I think that's fungus growing on the sooty mold. So this is a highly infested uh, spot here. Um, and let's we'll, we'll take a look, here's some grapevine. Or no, this isn't grapevine. I don't even know what vine this is. Um, but what I want to show you here is you see that shininess on the leaf? So that's honeydew, that's not rainwater. 
Um, that's all sticky honeydew. And these guys are all over here. Um, so uh, that's a grape leaf there. And then there's some other vine uh, growing around it. Um, so uh, what else do you want me to show, Jen? I, I mean, if you're, if it's possible, well, we, first of all, we have a bunch of questions that came in, but oh, sure. the, um, I thought it was cool that you were showing me grapevine at that spot yesterday. And then you realized yeah. because of the honeydew that they were lanternflies in there. Yeah. Well, I'll walk you right over to that same spot. Um, Can we ask you questions while you're going? Yeah. 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 I'm walking there now. So yeah, ask away. So one question can you talk about exactly what pesticides you're using in New Jersey? Sure. Um, so last year we were doing a lot of hack and squirt with triclopyr, which um, Garlon 4A, I guess it was called. And last year we spent most of the year doing hack and squirt method and uh, killing off Alanthus trees, uh, hoping to reduce their population and not have to come back to various sites. Uh, USDA has changed their protocol and this year there's no hack and squirts at all, no herbicide, and we're doing all 100% insecticide, mostly dino Uh The product we use is called, uh, there's your model a minute, in case you want to see it. Um, uh, the product we use is called TransTech. You can also use something called Safari. Um, so that's the product we use mostly. It's a systemic. Uh, we spray it only on Alanthus trees, and when it gets absorbed through the bark, that tree becomes toxic to feed on for the entire season. I think that's the best approach. Um, We're also dabbling with using um, uh, bifenthrin. The product we're using is called Bifen-IT. That's a contact uh, insecticide. So it's only gonna kill what it hits. We're only gonna spray that on vegetation, but it won't be limited to just tree of heaven. It'll be whatever we see the lantern fly is resting on. So we wanna see the lantern fly and then we will, um, and then we'll spray. So this is the spot from yesterday when I was talking to Jen, I was walking, I said, oh, those leaves look shiny. I wonder if there's any lantern fly. So if you can see through the, through the video, these leaves look awfully shiny and some of them are starting to look a bit darker. So that's the sooty mold growing. And then I looked up and I saw, and here they are, same as yesterday. Uh, you see that in fourth in star there? Yes, definitely. Yeah. That is really cool. And so that's a great find. Um, I was very surprised to see fourth in stars because we've had adults now for quite some time. Uh, can't really see it from this side because it's dark in here, but those are also fourth in stars, the, those shadows you're seeing. Uh, and they're moving around. They're a little bit harder to, uh, there they are. So you see all them? I don't know why this vine has, is full of fourth instars and not adults uh, when just a few feet away, it's all adults. Um, I guess it was a late hatch or something. Um, but anyways, that's really all I had to show you here on there. What did you say, this autumn olive or Russian? You said it's Russian. <laughs> it's <right>? autumn olive. <laughs> autumn olive. I keep getting confused. Um, yes, we're the land of invasive plants. Um, but yeah, I can answer any other questions you guys have. Got a couple more here. One, just a comment from someone in our state Asian longhorn beetle eradication program appreciates your shirt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, hey, um, we had that first. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's not something we necessarily want to brag about, but okay. Yeah. Um, someone was asking about 25B pesticides. So any natural products that we know of that are effective against lantern fly? I would say no, but is Saul, do you have anything I, I'm to not, we, we certainly are not trying to use any biologicals here. I don't know of any that are effective. Um, you know, we're just using straight up insecticides where we do use it. I'll warn you that the Bifen IT is a much more toxic product than the, um, than the other one, than the Dinotefuran. So, um, the bifen we suit up um we haven't done a lot of it yet and uh i've seen pictures out of pennsylvania and videos out of pennsylvania where they spray the bifen straight up in the air to get high up in the tree i think that would be very effective we're we're not doing that because of safety reasons 
So I don't know how effective our, our BIFEN treatments are going to be, but it's uh, after the end of August, we're planning on stopping our treatments of um, a dinotefuran because the tree of heaven is going to start going dormant for the season. It's going to drop its leaves, stop transpiring. So it won't be effective. Um, so, you know, after that, we scrape egg masses. We apply golden oil to egg masses. We want to keep doing stuff. So bifen will still work, you know, into September, October. We'll still be spraying that. Um, I will make a comment, too. I heard people talking uh, when you were doing your presentation earlier about... Um, uh, does it go to maple? When does it go to maple? In New Jersey, at least, uh, we've noticed they stay on the tree of heaven uh, probably until September. And then when the tree of heaven stops, uh, you know, translocating its sugars and stuff starts dropping its leaves, then um, it'll definitely swarm onto maple. And also what I've noticed is willow trees. It really loves willow trees. In fact, at least in the places I've been when there's willow and maple together, and this is again, only in the fall, when there's willow and maple together, they're going on the willow rather than the maple. So here's under the stilt grass, I just dig out that too. So you can see those guys. Someone was uh, also other? asked, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna ask you if there's more questions. Yeah, I mean, someone was saying like, if it's a heavy infestation, are you doing more than one application of, of the same pesticide or are you not doing that and like going, I'm kind of. Um... No, we're going somewhere else. Uh, the dino is good for the whole season. Okay. So once you've sprayed those trees, um, you, you don't have to go back. Um, and you know, back when we were doing herbicide, obviously, except for quality control purposes, we might go back for that. But um, we're, we're trying to get more sites. So uh, the more sites, the better. Um, and, uh, we're, we're focusing only now we're focusing only on, uh, transportation hubs like seaports, airports, train yards, high volume shipping operations. Um, so you see the red X that's how we used to mark our insecticide trees. Um, so we're, we're not, you know, trying to eradicate. We're only trying to slow the spread, um, and uh, I don't know how effective <laughs> it's been because other states keep getting more, more and more. I wish I could show you guys the uh, honeydew dripping because I'm feeling it on my head. Um, here's some really black leaves. Look at that. So that, mean, that tree, that tree had a red X. So that's been treated this year. That but was treated. Was still not this year. No. Oh, okay. This is not. This is no longer one of our treatment sites because it's just a park. Okay. So this, this was actually the second find in New Jersey was in the neighborhood behind this park. The first find was up in Pohat Kong in Warren County. The second one was here in Mercer County. It was just a nymph. And uh, so I've been visiting this park for three years. We treated here in 2019, but in 2020, we didn't. In 2021, we're not because it's no longer considered a high risk uh, location. We have to really focus our limited resources on uh, the places, you know, that, that it's most likely to spread from. Uh, look at this. This is a, this is a very uh, infested tree. I, I know the sun's going to make this. Yeah. They're all the way up the bark there. I'll also show you a hack and squirt tree just for the fun of it. So this tree, you see those marks? So that's where the hack and squirt was done. So the hatchet swings into the bark makes a cavity, then you squirt the triclope here in there and uh, this tree is completely dead. So it just takes a few squirts from a little handheld bottle. And that was the approach, which was uh, kill the smaller trees, leave the larger ones alive, and then apply dino to the larger ones. That was sort of the traditional approach uh, all along. Oh my goodness, here's a good one too. Huh? I'm gonna show you one more at least. Look okay, at that's that file. Good. I think uh, after okay. this last one, we might, we will need to switch over to Jeremy, but otherwise Absolutely. we're going to keep so, you here all day because this right. is really cool. <laughs> well, here's another shiny leaf. So you can see all the honeydew, uh, but I'm just looking at, at tromp through this stilt grass and uh, I don't know if you can see that from a distance or tell me when you do, but that's one of the biggest 
piles of lantern fly I've ever seen. So swarming mass here. So this was, you know, like I said, this exact spot in 2018, I was lucky to find three adults after scouring the park. And now you can see just three years later what we're up against. I mean, this whole tree is covered. You can't see it probably in this, but it's, uh, it goes all the way up. Um, so uh, we definitely showed you, I think, what can happen. So I'm, I'm happy to uh, give the screen back to you guys, unless you have another question. I mean, there are a ton of other questions. I would say we're going to move over to Jeremy. And if you're able to stay, Saul, then we might have some more questions at the end. But if you have to go, I understand. I'm, I'm happy to stay. I've unshared my screen. So um, just uh, call on me as you need me. OK, so we're going to switch over to Jeremy. But I think yeah, let's let me look at the chat. Sorry, guys. Got five windows open here. Oh, good. All right, so Jeremy, you're set on your talk time. Okay, let's see. I have an actual, there. Okay, I am pleased to introduce Jeremy, Dr. Jeremy Anderson. He is a postdoctoral researcher at the Elkington Lab at UMass Amherst, where he is working on at least spotted lanternfly, but possibly more insects because Joe has always got like five different projects going. So um, Jeremy is doing some really cool um, survey work with experimental lures. And so we invited him here today to talk about that project, um, just to give you a little bit of background about other stuff that's going on related to spotted lanternfly in Massachusetts. So Jeremy, ready to take it away? Yeah, Jen, thanks so much. Yeah, um, I mean, that was amazing seeing uh, what Saul uh, is seeing in the field in, in New Jersey. Uh, and the work that, that we're doing um, is an integrated research and extension project where we're, we're trying to do a combination of, of extension outreach, um, similar to webinars like this, uh, but also experiment with, with uh, lures that might help surveys in, in low density situations. Um, so this is, this is a, a new project that we started this summer uh, and I'll just kind of show you uh, what we've been doing, uh, how we've been been trapping, um, and uh, definitely uh, interested in, in questions um, as they come up. So this is a, a collaboration. Um, as Jen was saying, I'm a postdoc with Joe Elkington. Uh, Joe, for those who know him, uh, there, there's never a dull moment in, in the lab. Uh, we've, we've trying to work on Asian longhorn beetle, emerald ash borer, hemlock woolly adelgid, uh, Japanese knotweed control. There's there's no end to the uh, invasive insects that and plants that we're working with. Um, and then Jaime Pinheiro, who is the extension fruit tree entomologist, and Tony Simiski, who is our extension uh, entomologist at UMass. And uh, Miriam Cooperbend at USDA APHIS, she's the one who's doing the, uh, the, the, the chemical ecology work to try to come up with, with new attractants, uh, uh, particularly in these low density situations. So if you've got a single lantern flies showing up, if you've got small numbers, can we kind of get out ahead of them? Um, like um, as Josh showed the Massachusetts map, this was back in December. Um, but you know, this is something that there are small numbers, a single individual showing up, um, but based on the host range um, on the left here, this is, this is a, a publication that showed survivability of the different instars on different hosts. Uh, and a lot of these are, are trees, um, and, and other plants that we have um, both planted uh, as ornamentals, but also um, native uh, as part of our landscape here uh, in Massachusetts. So we are expecting, or at least it has the potential uh, to establish. Uh, and the map on the right is kind of like a, a heat map. And I'm sorry for those who are colorblind. Um, it, it shows red, which is high probability of establishment. And that's along the Connecticut River Valley um, kind of central Massachusetts, and then uh, yellow, which is which is medium probability, but but it will likely be suitable habitat, um, which is most of eastern, all of central and eastern Massachusetts, uh, kind of western Mass, and some of these kind of border areas with Vermont and New Hampshire may not be as suitable, 
Um, but especially where we are at UMass, we're, we're concerned uh, and able to study along the Connecticut River Valley uh, to look for lanternfly uh, establishing. Um, and just very quickly, um, as I said, this is a, a collaboration as both an extension uh, and a research project. Uh, so we've been trying to work with fruit growers uh, doing a webinar series. I've got a link for an, a one that's coming up as well. If, if you want to learn more about spotted lanternfly after this, um, trying to work with green industry professionals to, to give them the most up-to-date information on, on what type of treatments like the pesticides that you were asking about, um, what type of uh, kind of silvicultural management we can do to kind of slow down the spread. Um, and, and thankfully for us, at least in Western Mass, uh, Tree of Heaven isn't everywhere, um, but but when you start looking for it, it, it does show up, um, especially along uh, 91. Um, there's there's like this exit 15 on 91. All of a sudden, it just takes over as the the dominant kind of roadside shrub, um, and so that's that's definitely there is a corridor uh, for it to establish. And then as soon as you get into urban areas, um, it, it shows up, uh, especially in abandoned lots. Um, one thing that we're really um, interested in doing is, is promoting citizen scientists. So, so people like everyone here in, in the webinar, uh, trying to get them uh, to go out um, to look for lanternfly, uh, but also Tree of Heaven, uh, because it is a, a preferred host, having as much information about where we can find Tree of Heaven as possible has really been useful for us to um, identify locations that, that we might put the traps up for our surveys to try to maximize detecting uh, lanternfly uh, if it becomes established in, in the state. And um, our research plots, um, so we, we've divided this up, uh, Jaime Pinheiro and, and his group have been working in, in orchards, which are these orange circles, um, and in vineyards, the, the yellow circles. Um, and there they're, they're using um, the trapping method, um, but they're, they're not using the experimental lure. And in our lab, we're, we're using the experimental lure as well as some other trapping methods. Uh, and those are these kind of red triangles. And we have a, a, a site down outside of New Haven um, where we've got a trap as well, just to try to you know, see, see what's happening there. And, and our idea was that we'd have this kind of like corridor going up the Connecticut River, um, which we think is high probability for establishment. And if there's something there, um, we would provide that information right away to MDAR. Um, otherwise, you know, as a long-term site, uh, long-term research project, we, we could study the spread um, of, of lanternfly in the state. Um, and kind of, you know, the, the, the key to what we've been doing is we're comparing methyl salicylate, uh, wintergreen, which is a, a broad attractant uh, for a lot of uh, insects, um, to these kind of um, new attractant that, that Miriam has developed. Um, it, it's not quite a pheromone, um, or they're not quite willing to call it that yet, but it does kind of piggyback off of the aggregation behavior that, that Saul showed you um, in the video. Um, so the, the males particularly uh, seem to aggregate together um, and, and we can kind of, she's been able to identify some compounds that are associated with that aggregation and, and synthesized um, a chemical which is put into these, um, you can see uh, this is a circle trap um, it's commercially available. You can get it from Great Lakes IPM or, or Tresse or who, whoever you're, you normally buy supplies from. It's a modified pecan weevil trap or plum cucurulio. Um, and it just has a Ziploc bag on the top. The insects crawl up the trunk and, and go right into the bag uh, where you can remove them. The, the chemical is put into these, these kind of, um, it's like a hard caulking um, that, that we spread. We put uh, 25 dollops on each tree. And that's supposed to bring the lantern flies to the tree. And then as, you know, as we were talking before, they have this behavior of climbing up the tree uh, and then they get trapped in the bag, ideally. So we're comparing this methyl salicylate and controls. Um, thankfully, although it does make it difficult for research, we haven't recovered any uh, spotted lantern fly yet at any of our sites, uh, but we have started to see differences in the type of insects that are collected uh, by these different methods. Uh, some of our sites, uh, we've been working with folks who are, are particularly concerned about pollinators. Uh, even though Tree of Heaven is a, a non-native uh, and, and invasive plant, it is a, a resource uh, for, for some, especially honeybees. Uh, so they were very concerned that, that honeybees might getting, become trapped in these. So we, we're 
you know, at least getting some data about the different uh, suitability of these traps for, for bycatch um, for people who are concerned about not collect, or, you know, minimizing uh, native insect collection. Um, and, and lastly, uh, we, we've had one webinar um, already introducing the, the extension at, and research component of this project. Uh, there's a link here if you'd like to watch it. Uh, and we do have one coming up on August 31st. Uh, similarly, you can register for, for pesticide credits um, and, and the link is here and, and we can provide that um, as well afterwards. And with that, um, just please feel free to email me uh, with any questions about the trap design, uh, about the lures, uh, about the work that we're doing. And I'd like to thank uh, Amanda Halperin, who's here on the left, and, and Caroline Chanel, who have been doing all of the survey work and, and hanging the traps. And um, I don't know if Saul noticed this uh, at his site in New Jersey, but Tree of Heaven seems to have a, a somewhat uh, symbiotic relationship with poison ivy, uh, bittersweet, and multiflora rose. So once you get to a site, you just get hammered by all, all sorts of things, and ticks um, particularly. And, and that's all I've got. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Jeremy. Please um, put a link in the chat to registration for your webinar so that folks can access it. Um, I apologize because I'm doing 30 different things at once. But um, if you didn't mention that it was free and that it has pesticide license credits, I would think that that is a big selling point for a lot of the folks on the webinar today. <laughs> I'll provide that right away. And I, I did one last thing. Um, this is from Sunday. My One of my neighbors emailed. Uh, this is not in Massachusetts. She was at a coffee shop in Manhattan. And she emailed me saying, is this the moth you're looking for? And I was like, <laughs> well, yes and no. It is the insect we're looking for. But as Josh showed, it, it it's not a moth. But this was just on a potted plant right outside of a coffee shop in Manhattan. Uh, so it's it's there. Uh, just, you know, please, everyone here, keep your eyes out for it. And I'll share the link for the webinar. And, and thank you so much. Thank you. We were on a call, I think, a week ago where they said that they found spotted lanternfly. And my ignorance of New York is going to show here. But I think in all six boroughs of New York City, including way up on a rooftop garden on a skyscraper. So it's pretty well entrenched in that part of New York. Um, all right, let's see. I think we're gonna switch it back to Josh so he can finish stuff up. Um, and then just a reminder, if you're looking for pesticide license credits, do hang on until the end. And also you, the poll is coming up soon. Yep. And Jeremy um, just put a link in the chat for his webinar. So definitely register for that if it's up your alley. Go ahead, Josh. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for that, Jeremy and Saul. Those are very interesting uh, sections. So. Um, I'm gonna try and go through the last part fairly quickly so we're not holding everyone super late. Um, so just very, very quickly about the, um, the survey efforts in Massachusetts. Um, so we have, uh, there's 50 sites total that MDAR is serving throughout the state. Um, sites are, you know, we're, we're hanging traps with lures. We're um, finding sites based on like presence of tree of heaven. Um, in high risk areas like where businesses are shipping in goods from out of state, especially from infested states uh, and places with high value agricultural products like grapes and apples. Um, several different sites throughout the state that Massachusetts um, has, uh, has shown like the, uh, you can see like the blue Pentagon. So it's a pretty good um, selection of the state, including some high risk areas like, you know, along major cities and highways. Um, so. Haven't found anything yet, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, the survey process is pretty simple. It's um, hanging traps. It's um, surveying tree of heaven and other host trees, but especially tree of heaven with binoculars from all four sides, looking for signs of egg masses, for signs of uh, the nymphs or the adults. Uh, and the traps can be um, one of two things. So um, they can either be a circle trap, which you can see right here. It is a um, kind of a, a big circle of mesh that's wrapped around the tree to make an envelope such that as the liner fly crawls up the tree, trying to get to the more tender leaves or par other parts of the tree, it's going to climb through the, uh, the mesh and then be funneled into this either a bag or a plastic bag or a, a jug or a jar of some kind where it's going to stay stuck. Then those bags can be collected. This is a pretty good way to get the liner fly and uh, a, a pest lure is used to kind of like lure them in. Um, some trees use a, uh, a sticky trap with a bug barrier like this. It's a uh, very simple sticky tape um, 
and the, st the sticky part is on the inside of that circle. So when the insect is crawling up the tree, they get stuck on the tape as they like are crawling. Um, having something like this in the circle trap means we're minimizing the effective bycatch from other large animals like birds or squirrels, which if the sticky tape was facing outward, could happen. So these are what we're using at all 50 sites. Um, we have not found any spotted lanternfly so far at any of these sites or any of these traps, despite um, you know, all of our survey efforts. UMass Extension, which of course you just heard is also doing survey efforts, has not found anything yet. Um, still working on some of those sites, but uh, that's going to continue throughout the season. The, um, currently the high-risk targets include places that are um, you know, going to be the target of long-range transportation and shipping, as we've mentioned several times. Um, that's kind of the main risk of lanternfly being spread. Um, High risk targets would include things that are like, you know, high, high traffic rail and transit pathways. You know, trains can also transport these goods, especially if they go through infested states like New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, et cetera. Um, anything that's like a, uh, any company that's shipping a high volume of goods and services. Um, industries that are very involved in shipping goods, including the nursery and green industry. You know, a lot of nurseries will purchase stock from, uh, from other states, you know, um, like plants that are grown in large sites elsewhere or high value agricultural commodities like uh, fruit trees and grapes. Um, any kind of port of entry where like goods can be shipped in from uh, other states or from out of the country even. Um, part of the outreach efforts has also included um, signs such as this, uh, mini posters with lanternfly information that have been hung in rest stops along uh, Route 90, the Mass Pike, uh, to inform visitors that come in if you have been traveling down the pike this summer or will be soon. Um, if you stop at any of those rest stops along the pike, you might see these in the uh, the lobby. You know, the uh, the QR code on that will take you right to our fact page with information, and uh, and these are in, are available on our fact page. You can like download them and print them, and then use them yourself at um, locations throughout your community, or like give them to families, friends, to local businesses um, that are willing to hang them up, put them like on public spots like telephone poles, anything like that. Um, I think we're are we doing the questions now, Jen, or saving them for the end? I mean, I would like to do the polling questions now because we're at an hour. We're going to continue to take Q&A and respond as, as long as we can. We did book an hour and 15 minutes for this presentation, as you would have noted when you registered, but I'm going to attempt to relaunch the poll. It will clear existing polling results. If you already answered the poll questions the first time they came up, please just answer them again. Anyway, I've just launched the poll. Can other folks, can, can you confirm, panelists, can you confirm that you can see the poll or not? I forget I can, if I let you. I can see them, yes. I can see it, all right. Uh, and I see answers coming in. So we're gonna give, there's three questions here. Please answer all of them. Uh, we'd love for folks that aren't here for the credits to still answer the questions just so that we can gauge um, how good of a job we did teaching you stuff. Um, I guess I actually can see the, answers as they come in, which is pretty cool. And I can say that you're doing really well with question one. Um, don't forget to scroll down and answer all three of the questions. Just gonna give you a few more things. Um, let's see, what else did I wanna make sure we say? Yeah, we, so we let a few of the Q and A's that came in kind of hang on until the end. If we don't get to all of them before we end the webinar, then you'll get a response by email. Um, but there are a few things I thought we were going to answer live that we're going to, uh, Josh, are you, you're done with your slides or no? Uh, there's a few more, but uh, I'm uh, going to go through a few more so and I time for questions. Whole, I apologize. Yeah. Um, hopefully it's okay that I ran all three. I think that's fine. I think we've covered enough to uh, kind of answer all the questions. The last part is just sort of um, kind of what you people as like attendants of this webinar can do um, in your field. So okay. just kind of a, it's a wrap up. All right, I'm gonna give this another 10 seconds to respond because it looks like this, the, we've got 90% participation. Um, and we're gonna end the poll and I'm gonna share the results quickly. So the first question, how does spotted fly, lanternfly damage plants? The answer was, it, you know, it sucks the sap out of the plants and produces that sooty mold that, that we got to see so well with Saul's video feed. Um, the second question, what are the main host species of adult spotted lanternfly? The correct answer was tree of heaven and grape. It is not really known to be attracted to oak. Um, 
And then the third question, what is the current status of spotted lanternfly in Massachusetts? The answer is that we've had several finds in 2020 and now a few in 2021, but still no established infestations and no breeding population. Okay, I have stopped sharing the poll. Josh, you can go ahead and finish up. All right, so I'll try and do this quickly so we have time for questions and don't run past 11.15. Um, so very generally, actions you can take as uh, experts in the pesticide field or the tree health field, members of the public, um, whoever you are. Um, so one, learn to identify lanternfly in all its life stages. I think after that video, you should all be experts. Um, if you find a lanternfly um, in any life stage, make sure you take a picture of it or trap and save it in like a bag or a jar, put it in the freezer. So um, if an MDAR inspector needs to come collect the sample, you will have it for them. Um, it's much better for us to like identify either off a sample or a picture rather than just a description. Uh, check your vehicle and equipment for signs of hitchhiking lanternfly, especially if you're coming from out of state. Uh, if you're working with any host plants like maple, tree of heaven, grape, um, those are kind of the big ones, willow as well later in the season, uh, make sure you're looking for signs of lanternfly, either the insect itself, the honeydew, or that uh, sooty mold. Uh, acquire and distribute outreach materials to colleagues and clients, either things like our ID card seen at the bottom or the mini poster. Um, the mini poster and other paper goods you can download and print from a website the ID cards, um, there will be a link at the end that you'll see where you can uh, order them for free from us, um, any amount that you need. Um, spread information to people in your field, obviously, and, you know, the more people know, the better. Um, specific to, um, to kind of the green industry, um, you know, make sure you're looking at goods and nursery stock that are imported from other states, especially if it's a state with a known infestation. Make sure you keep a log of where nursery stock is imported from and sold to in case some sort of backtracking is necessary. Um, you know, if lanternfly shows up in some other state and there's a chance that you may have sold goods to that state, it's important to know that in case you kind of need to see if you got things from a certain site. Uh, make sure you keep up to date on other states' lanternfly policies. Things might be different in other states where you're selling it. Um, you can take a compliance training course from Pennsylvania and New Jersey just to kind of get more information or kind of see what the latest is. Regularly check your vehicles and equipment for signs of lanternfly and eggs. Uh, and there have been some studies where, um, especially from, I think, like uh, Pennsylvania Extension, where they've used wire mesh to protect plant stock, especially in vineyards. Um, that's not necessary at this point, since we don't have an infestation in Massachusetts, but it's a good thing to keep in mind for the future if that becomes necessary. Um, other goods that you can download from our website include this best management practice for nurseries and landscapers, which is like a nice list of kind of the best things you can do in your business as well as this checklist for uh, moving companies or anyone who's moving goods. So just things that you should check for signs of lanternfly. Um, again, you can download and print these from our website, which is right down there at the bottom, massnrc.org slash pests slash SLF. And we will put that in the chat as well. So you can just copy paste that if needed. Um, and one last thing to keep in mind, MDAR and other state agents, if they want to call you, if they want to work with you, are not here to um, you know shut down your business. They're we're, we're cooperatives. We're trying to kind of make sure we can get all the information we can to prevent the spread of lanternfly. Um, no one control method or plan is going to be applicable in all situations. So we have to kind of assess situations individually to see what next steps must be. Um, whatever's being done in states like New Jersey, where we have those very dramatic uh, live streams, might not be an effective strategy in Massachusetts, including use of pesticides. We're definitely not at that state in Massachusetts and states with infestations will be changing their pesticide plans kind of uh, accordingly. And of course, future webinars, we have one scheduled for November and February, will provide updates on strategies as they change if necessary. Um, I think we already talked about pesticides, um, not used right now in Massachusetts, and there's a lot of pesticides that are shown to be effective against the lantern fly because they're fairly susceptible to a lot of different things. Um, but as uh, Saul said, you know, it comes to a certain point in the season when they're not really used um, anymore um, once we're past a certain life stage, but um, it's kind of not really saying you have to worry about so much in Massachusetts. Um, if we get to a point where that's necessary, you will hear about it in, uh, in this series or from one of the experts in the state. We've already answered the poll questions. Um, so these are right here, some links that are important to you. Our fact page right here, massnrc.org slash pest slash SLF is where you can order uh, goods, where you can look at all of our lanternfly information, report whatever you find. And there's some very good links there um, to help you with identification. Uh, our Twitter account is MassPests, where you can get updates, uh, links to articles, other useful things. 
And if you would like to order free materials, including those ID cards, you can do it at uh, this shortened URL right here. That's again going to be put in the chat box. So you can um, just copy paste it instead of having to write that down. Um, our next webinar is going to be on November 16th. That is a Tuesday uh, at 10 a.m. The registration link will be provided soon. Um, if you attend this webinar, you will get an email with the link and with the relevant information. And again, if you are looking for credits and have not sent us your email and pesticide license number, very important, as well as the category you are looking for, please send it to Jennifer. Uh, her email is right there. Uh, and that is our presentation. I think we still have, we do have some time still for questions, so we will try and get through those. Yes, thank you, Josh, and thank you for having to kind of run through that at the end really quickly. Um, let's see, okay. Somebody had a, a quick comment that you probably already covered, but just in case, I just kind of want to check this off. Someone was mentioning that um, they had, they have, their son had spotted, spotted Land of Lion Central Park and is traveling from New York and was mentioning that it's good to monitor car and, cars and trucks and to, was suggesting reaching out to car and truck rental agencies. Um, somebody asked a question about the lifespan of the adult lanternfly. Josh, can you answer that? Um, so the adult lanternfly matures around now, August or September, depending on where in the country you are, and they die off with the first hard frost. So probably November, December is when they're die. So they're, the adults are only active for a few months and the insect from hatching to death is, you know, the course of one season or one year. Thank you. Um, someone was asking about Asian countries dealing with these infestations. I know it's native to China and has spread to some of the other countries in Asia, like Japan and Korea. I don't have any specific information on that. Um, Josh or the other panelists, I just wanna open it up to you guys if you could help weigh in on that. So about um, control methods and predators, was that the, que was that the question? Uh, how are other countries in Asia dealing with the infestations? Um, so I, I'm guessing Jeremy might be able to answer better, but I believe in other countries there are uh, parasites or fungi, I think it's mostly parasitic wasps or other insects that do keep the population down. Yeah, um, definitely that's, that's my understanding as well. There's there's a suite of, of natural enemies in in Asian countries where it's found that we we don't have here. Um, there was a question as well about native um, predators in the Northeast. Um, there are a couple records, or or at least at least two records of of native species feeding on um, spotted lanternfly, um, but they they don't feed you know they don't cause as much uh, mortality as as you would be find um, in, in China or, or in Korea. Um, and, and the U folks at USDA APHIS are, are actively working right now. Um, COVID kind of made things a little more difficult, um, but they, they are, um, they have been doing foreign exploration. Uh, they have, have some promising looking uh, natural enemies that they'll be testing. Uh, but those, you know, before those, if one is, is approved for release, that it might be another, you know, five, 10 years before it's actually released in the field. All right, sorry, was that, did you just answer a, a different question? Sorry, I'm trying to answer a million questions about <sighs> pesticide license credits. Um, did you just pivot and answer a different question about the predators? There were two questions, yes. One was about how do Asian countries deal with this? And the yeah, other one right. was, do we have native predators? Yeah, sorry, I was like, there's, I have to manage the questions so that I make sure I answer them all and it's kind of complicated. All right, so the, the uh, all right. Um, I want it, there is a citizen science project that is tracking predators in the Northeast and they've documented things like birds eating them and praying mantises eating them, but not to a point where they're controlling the population at all. All right, um, that doesn't seem like a good one to answer right now. Um, we answered the adult question. Sorry, I'm just kind of going through here. Um, at this point, we're at the time for the end of the webinar, but we're going to stay on and answer questions if you want to. If you have to leave, I totally understand. Uh, I just want to get to all of these things. Someone was asking, is Tree of Heaven the same as Sumac? They're 
completely different species, although they occupy the same habitat a lot of the time. And spotted lanternfly has been found on staghorn and smooth sumac, but it doesn't, I don't think it completes its life cycle. Anyone wanna, if anyone has anything to, if any of the panelists have anything to add to that, feel free. Um, that question is done. And then we had, oh, right. There were two questions about natural predators. All right, thanks, sorry. It's a lot to keep track of. All right, um, and then somebody had a question in the, in the chat that I just wanted to bring up in case, especially because, you know, Saul has a lot of on the ground experience and I know Jeremy is working with folks that are particularly targeting um, orchards. They were asking, has spotted lanternfly been prevalent in, in peaches where there are infestations? And I, I had answered just to him that it does congregate in orchards, but um, if any of the panelists have anything to add on that, please feel free. Yeah, this is Saul. I, I don't have a good sense of what's going on in the orchards. Um, I do know that uh, grape growers, whether it's a vineyard or they're just growing grapes for the vineyard, um, in the grapes, it's, it's a massive problem. Um, obviously, you can spray for it. It's an insect. It dies when you put insecticide on it. Um, but what it may do is it may uh, cause uh, you know, cause the grower to spray more often than they would have in the past. Um, I see spray recommendations for it now coming out of Rutgers. They have a weekly IPM and they do counts now and they tell them to start spraying. Um, uh, we hear that, you know, if it feeds on grapes too much, other things could, uh, you know, additional problems like winter injury or something could actually kill the vine. I've personally seen it on grapes in an orchard setting and it's pretty impressive. I mean, they just swarm those things and um, it's pretty bad. I don't know. I have not heard anything about orchards being swarmed yet. Um, I, I'm sure it's possible, but I have not heard that. And I'll just throw in one last thing is that the state of New Jersey is, we're, we're looking at the possibility of helping farmers to spray in the future if we, we did get some state money um, and we feel that that's more effective. And what we used to do is try and create a buffer zone around the edge of the farm, uh, spraying tree of heaven, you know, outside of the farm, trying to create a quarter mile buffer. Um, I don't know if that was ever supported by scientific research or not, but that used to be our approach. Um, we have kind of dropped that approach now and uh, we feel that um, you know, spraying the perimeter of a place is less important than spraying the actual crop. Um, I know that doesn't directly answer the question, but that's, that was a comment I had. Okay, that's, no, that's good. Um, there's one more quick question. It's very kind of in the weeds of insecticide application. Someone was asking about, you know, application for contact insecticides using mist blowers, coarse droplet spray, et cetera. I don't know if New Jersey is one of the states that's been working with the mist blowers. I believe Virginia, and I, it, I don't know if West Virginia has been, but I know some of the states that are working along the rail lines where there's so much tree of heaven and they're concerned about spotted lanternfly spraying have been using mist blowers. But Saul, do you have any input on that? Yeah, we're not. Not yet, anyway. We're not using mist blowers. Um, and what we're, when we're applying, this is for the Bifen IT or the Bifenfen product, we're using um, large droplets. We're trying to make sure it's not blowing around because we consider that one to be a lot more toxic. Um, and even the Dino Tefteran, you know, we're spraying directly on a tree trunk, not more than 12 inches away, only up to chest high, you know. And we are not blasting the bifenser and upwards like using a mist blower i think the pictures and videos i saw were out of pennsylvania for that along the train tracks and um we are not doing that in new jersey we're keeping it to large droplets i don't think our staff we're not going higher than chest high to reduce any risk of blowback towards us so we're really trying to keep safety first when applying that contact pesticide thank you all right that is that are, that's all the questions we have. Thank you everybody who hung on until the end there. We went, oh, we only have three minutes over what we had said we were gonna be. Um, if there aren't any further questions, I think we're just gonna end this, although I'm gonna keep this open because I'm dealing with some survey and polling question issues. Um, but thank you everybody for attending. Thank you very much to all of our panelists. Um, 
thanks jo uh, to Jeremy and Saul for taking time out of your busy days to talk about your projects to the folks here. We really appreciate it. You're Have welcome. a good day. It was, it was fun. It was a blast. Thanks, Saul. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you, thanks, everyone, Paul. for attending.